Tim, welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on this evening. We are talking Rolex and Omega, their weirdest watches and why you should buy them, the best chronographs, and I am sharing your viewer wrist shots here on Watches Tonight. Spare a thought for my employer, thewatchbox.com, the best place to buy, trade, or sell a watch with over 3,000 pre-owned and vintage watches live right now. Open it up in a different window, keep me streaming. And to buy, I have a new direct service email line, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. Reach out directly to me with your questions, comments, and queries. I am ready and waiting with my colleague Brandon, who helps me with the volume. He's a lifesaver, and so are you guys. Dr. J leading us off, getting us underway with his scorching Grand Seiko SBGH 267. Joe R is hiking the Appalachian Trail in Pennsylvania, locally, with his ball engineer, Master 2 Diver. I love ball watches, you get a lot for your money. Simar M and his El Primero powered Spirit of Big Bang recline by the pool, nicely framed and composed. And Mikal and his rare Omega DeVille Prestige take to the skies in Warsaw, Poland. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on my pixels. Let's jump into the box and see who's live and loud. Jumping in, Eddie Landsberg. Eddie, I got your text. I'm going to do my best to advise. Mr. No Date, Adam Crossfire, Watches and Whiskey, Junior Johnson, Paul T, Ordinary 999, Lisa K, Derek P. We got a friend from Amsterdam, Paul. Very nice to see you in the box. Thanks for staying up late in continent. Europe. We got Jenk72 from Bala, Wales. I'm in Bala, Kenwood, which I think is an old Welsh enclave in Pennsylvania. I got Ahmad joining in from Canada, and I've got Marco staying up late in Firenze, the home of Panerai. All right, let's jump back in and talk a little bit about some weird watches from some very mainstream brands. Rolex and Omega, truthfully, they are as mainstream as mainstream luxury watches get. That means their prices, their products, their volumes, even their advertising are geared to serve the meat of the market. A lot of people who are episodic or one-time buyers who do not meet the textbook definition of a collector or even an enthusiast. And this is why I am struck by each of these two brands' weirdest watch. But unlike the bad weird Toyota-based Aston Martin Signet, yes, this, this really, that really happened, but divert your eyes, I would say the watches you're about to see are good weird, like the 4x4 hatchback Ferrari FF. You see that there? That is good weird. So for Rolex, I considered the obvious, the Milgauss Z Blue, which is certainly a watch with potential and my favorite Rolex, but it's only weird by Rolex standards. Everywhere else, a little bit of orange, a splash of green, a blue dial, a three-hand no-date, it's not that ambitious. That's Rolex weird. Weird weird, though, is the Rolex Yachtmaster 2. Now, when this watch came out at Basel World 2007, can we go full screen with that, Sean? When this came out at Basel World 2007, people were looking at the blinding array of colors, especially that white dial, and they were dubbing this one the Clown Master. And I can't disagree. This became the theoretical flagship of the Rolex line, and to this day, it remains the most complex Rolex watch ever made. Literally no one at the time was asking for a $50,000 44mm program programmable flyback chrono regatta timer with mechanical memory. That's a tongue twister even for me, but we got one anyway. And I'm glad to live in a world where Rolex makes this crazy watch. I have to be honest, it's unfairly compared to the also nominally 44 millimeter deep sea. That is an entirely different ball game. This thing wears like a giant Daytona. It does not wear like the deep sea. And I can wear this, but I cannot wear the deep sea. The Yachtmaster 2 is a mechanical regatta timer with a couple of different looks. So that's the steel model. Now, if you haven't seen this watch before, what it does is it allows you to program a one to 10 minute countdown. That's the countdown to the start of a match within a regatta, a sailboat race. You have the countdown dial, that big triangular index at center, and it will fly forward or fly back to the next nearest minute, whether that's back or forward, the watch knows. Now you can program how many minutes it counts down, and then after actuating the reset, it will remember and it will count down again. Assuming you have a standardized countdown within a series of matches, it will always revert to the prior programming, which is really cool. So there's also 
by the way, the Steel Watch came out in 2013. We're keeping score here. A lovely albino version. Now, this one's my favorite because it's all white gold with a platinum bezel, and it's one of the rarest modern Rolex watches. Add the unusual model, an unusual and rare version of an unusual model, and the complication factor, plus the fact that this watch really is just snow blindness on your wrist. This is a very special watch. Some will say that the rose gold two-tone is the warmest, and I do think that's probably the best if you wanna go gold, but you don't wanna go full bold gold with the yellow model. That one's overpowering, this one's a bit more approachable. A quick collector's note on the white gold model. When that came out, again, it was almost a $50,000 watch in the mid-2000s, and after 2013, no one bought this model because you could now get the same look, albeit with a blue bezel, in a stainless steel watch that debuted under $18,000. So people just flat out stopped buying the white gold model. The dial changed as there was a variation in 2013 with blued hands to make it a bit easier to read. And then in 2017, it got the Mercedes hands. All of which is to say there are a couple of sub variants of this watch. If you want the rarest by far, go for the Mercedes hands. The newest version and the one because of the steel watch that no no one is buying. If you want to own a Rolex for the next 20, 30 years and take a little bit of a punt on speculative collectability, this is a great way to get in with a watch that is just laugh out loud fun to wear. Now prices range, of course, from the steel model at $18,750. If you want to buy the white gold platinum today, it's $48,150. Forget the Daytona. The Yachtmaster 2 is the Rolex chronograph to buy and shockingly useful when used off-label. You can use it for timing fish tacos on the grill. Always very time sensitive. The kids time out. Make it fun for you, not them. And also practicing individual LSAT games. Hey, who knows? Maybe if you're looking to open a new chapter in your life. Those things are hardcore and tightly timed. This is the best way to train your mind and your sense of pacing. Jumping into the box, let's see who's right here. Abdul saying, I really like the white gold one, but too big for my taste and wrist. And then Chris NYC, counterpoint, easily my least favorite Rolex. It's just ugly. Right here, Mark S, Chris NYC, I can't disagree. He's not a fan. DB, Greetings from Warwickshire, fellow watch lovers. Thank you for staying up late in England with us. And then right here, Outlaw saying, nice to be back. Outlaw, it's nice to have you back with us. JBO Surf of Adelaide, Australia, sounding morning all. Sounding off at good morning, JBO, getting up as we end our day. And then Adam Crossfire saying, laugh out loud, that Steel Yacht Master is probably my favorite Rolex. Not sure what that says about me. Don't worry, you're in good company. I like the white gold model. All right, let's take a look at your wrist shots, your analog on my digital, as I like to say. Pradeep I continues our watch and dog theme with his Tudor Black Bay GMT and man's best friend, clearly tuckered out from playing too much catch or fetch. Tamim from Bahrain brings my favorite Rolex, the Milgauss Z Blue to your screen. I love the lighting in the background. That makes the shot. Abdul R, live in the chat box tonight, explodes into the frame with this verdant spring shot of his Zin 356. And Ari F impresses with a barely colorized image of his Rolex Sea Dweller 43. Nicely done, guys. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Now for Omega. I considered the Seamaster Bullhead chronograph as the weirdest watch, but it is at best the second weirdest Omega. And it's not even the weirdest Omega Vintage Revival model. No, that would be the Omega Seamaster 1200 meter Ploprof. Mmm, strange watch and rarely seen in person, but I should mention it is watch time editor-in-chief Roger Ruger's regular watch and daily driver. Why? Well, remember the 1970 Seamaster 600 meter, the original Ploprof, the 166077? That was the Plongeur Professionnel, the Ploprof. It was reborn in 2009 as the Omega SMP 1200M. Its bracelet set a new standard for quality, feel and features. Omega calls it shark proof, which is great because the rest of your body is going to be shark bait, but your wrist will be fine. As you can see, it is a lovely stabe manufactured mesh bracelet, which is a wonderful silken band of interlocked steel rings. Now it also has a deployant 
that was Omega's first with both a push button slider and an all or nothing dive extension. So this is a wonderful set of bracelet and clasp in combo with a unique watch. The case is fascinating on this watch thanks to a push lock release for the diving bezel which can then be turned either direction that orange plunger unlocks the bezel i'm showing you it from the back because it's easier to see you can also see that there is a crown that is a telescoping crown it actually has stanchions that extend from the case on both sides of the crown and it offers all aspect protection from abrasion and impact it's even better than the panerai locking guards this is a special watch but it's the fit that sets this watch apart and it might be the weirdest feature of the weirdest omega at 55 millimeters wide the watch is broad down your wrist but it's broad down your wrist not across it's only 48 millimeters from lug to lug, which means across your wrist, the top to bottom part, it's shorter across your wrist than a 40 millimeter Rolex Submariner. So if you can wear the sub, and I put up the Smurf because it is my favorite sub, you can wear the Ploprof. Don't be deceived. It's a thick hockey puck of a watch, but it's not broad across the wrist. And on that bracelet, it's the best of everything. 2015 though. I sense your objection, the watch is too heavy. Omega fixed that problem in 2015 with a comprehensive redesign to the previously steel Ploprof, which was now offered in titanium for the first time. And not just titanium, but that watch has a titanium dial, which is just cool looking. So this is a watch that is essentially the perfected version of the Ploprof Modern. It is light enough to be your daily driver, it is hypoallergenic, and being grade 5, not grade 2 titanium, it's light, but it's also more scratch resistant than steel. It gained a new master chronometer, certified caliber 8912, a no-date dial that some people prefer, and its first display case back, as you could now see the movement for which you had paid. All of which is to say that's the one to buy, unless you are really price sensitive. So. Let me plead to you, anyone considering a Seamaster Ploprof, you really need to think about what it surpasses. It surpasses the deep sea in ergonomics. It surpasses the planet ocean in ergonomics. It's more interesting than either one, and pre-owned, it's gonna cost you a heck of a lot less than the Rolex with more capability mixed in. So, it's light, it's short across the wrist, it's one of the best bracelets and clasps in the business, and the exclusivity is something I cannot overemphasize. Omega Seamasters, Planet Oceans, Diver 300 Meter, Aqua Terra, they're absolutely everywhere. The Omega Seamaster 300, the vintage one, it's everywhere. If you want a watch from a mainstream brand with a five-year warranty, a company that will be around forever to provide parts and services, but you don't want to see it on the wrist of everyone in your Omega Rolex office or club, this is the way to go. This is the timepiece that feels almost like you're buying a niche independent brand watch. Prices range from 9,400 if you want to get the original steel version on a rubber strap, all the way up to 18,000 if you want the two-tone rose and titanium version on a bracelet. For me, that's too much. The one I would say you buy is the $13,400 Ploprof titanium on the bracelet. The bracelet's too good to avoid. If you must have a strap, get it as an accessory. You'll thank me later. Get it on the bracelet. Get it in titanium. You're gonna love this watch. Try before you buy. Yes, that's always the rule and the caveat, but I think you're gonna be surprised by just how deeply you fall in love with this unusual diver from the people in BN. All right, let's take a look at the chat and then jump to some of your wrist shots. Paul T. asks, Tim, when will you show some Citizen Campanola watches on the show? That's not a bad idea. I generally stick to things I see on a regular basis pre-owned. I haven't seen any Campanola since the watch you want days, but they are some of the most beautifully handcrafted, generally quartz watches you will ever encounter. Handmade on the outside, hand-built on the inside, loaded with complication to the point that they include grand complications. So yes, I will feature them more in the future. I like them a lot. They are just scarce outside of Japan. So if you're all JDM and you replace the Acura logos with Honda on your personal car, this is going to be the watch for you. Jumping along right here, we got Mark S. shouting out to JBO in Adelaide. We had a comment about a GT4. I'm trying to find where that was. It looks like you guys are shouting out cars. 
Uh, bu -bu -bum -bu -bu -bum. But yes, I do like the Porsche GT4. Uh, I have to say, all things considered, the three cars I'm probably considering most closely from my next ride would be some sort of Lotus Elise supercharged, uh, either a C5 or C6 Corvette Z06. And I am just like perpetually in love with every version of the old Fisker Karma. I had one once. I'm very tempted to do it again now that it's the Rivero under new ownership. Uh, please, sanity, forgive me. And then right here I could see we've got friends saying, be safe wherever you are. These are crazy times. Mark S. Tim, please compare titanium versus stainless steel with respect to scratch resistance and corrosion resistance. Okay, a few things to know about titanium. There are definitely two different types. There's the, there's the silvery gray brushed grade 2 stuff, that's the cheapest you'll find. That's what's used for, for example, uh, you know, the old Diver 300 meter Bond Seamaster. It's what's used on the old X33. It's what's used on titanium Breitling Aerospaces. Then there's, that stuff can be polished. It's softer than steel, but it's lighter than steel. Now the grade five stuff, you can mirror polish. So if you see mirror polished titanium, that's a good sign that it's grade five. This stuff is great because it's as light as grade two but it's also known as 6.4 titanium. It is very scratch resistant, particularly when polished. It is almost impervious to the normal stuff that can deface your steel watches and certainly your precious metal watches. So I really like grade five. All hypoallergenic titanium, you're not gonna have a problem. Now corrosion. The grade two stuff seems to tarnish more easily. Titanium can oxidize, but the alloys used in watches generally will not. So what you'll find is on brushed titanium, it'll tarnish. You'll see these weird surface patterns that can easily be brushed off or polished off without removing any metal. That doesn't happen on the grade five stuff. All right, we got Pilot Style 123 joining from Ireland, and we've got Daniel Fernandez joining in from Mexico. All right, Edward Ledden asking, what is it with you and fish tacos, Tim? I know, I always use that for talking about the Yachtmaster 2, because you need to time them. They cook fast. If you're used to just firing up that piece of steak, big fatty meat from pigs and cows, you can just blast it with flames all day long to no effect. But the fish on the grill, you're going to have a sticky mess if you aren't exacting about your cook time. And that's where the Yachtmaster 2 comes in. Rolex, I bet you didn't know how fishy you were. All right, jumping back into our regularly scheduled program with some viewer wrist shots. Rick F. Overlooking Chicago from the highest of heights with his 25th anniversary Grand Longa 1. Navy man Josh of Yokosuka, Japan shares a watch box purchased Omega Seamaster Railmaster. Thank you for trusting our company. Simon H of Napa Valley enjoys a mountain bike ride with his Rolex Sea Dweller and Brian D strikes a pose with the still rare 2019 Tudor Black Bay P01. I actually like that watch a lot. Okay guys, remember, Monday mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Send me your wrist shots. I like watches and cars, watches and motorcycles, watches and bicycles, watches and dogs, and watches and whiskey. Don't forget that. I want to talk about chronographs now. For our main feature tonight, not the mainstream stuff like the Rolex Daytonas, the Breitling Navitimers, and the Omega Speedmasters. Why not those? Because almost without exception, they are hard to read. Quick, how many minutes elapsed? Mm, not so easy. They're too limited by their generally 30 minute displays. I find that minutes are the most important metric when you're using a chronograph and they're hard to read on the Navis, the Speedies, and the Daytonas. Also, they haven't seen those three much innovations in earnest since at least, ooh, the Ronald Reagan administration. So let's talk about watches that are innovative, easy to read, and easily the best of the 21st century. So I once shot a five reasons you don't want a chronograph feature, and a great deal of this was driven my own, by my own antipathy towards mainstream chronos. But I'm wearing a Zinn chronograph right now, so they can't all be bad, right? What gives? Well, let's discuss the best chronographs with logical layouts, epic legibility, and or innovative engineering, and of course, a high degree of exclusivity. We're talking about watches you don't see every day. So the Rolex Yachtmaster has been discussed. I won't belabor the point. You've already heard what I think of it and why it's special, especially when it's not used as a regatta timer. This would have made my list of best chronographs with its large minute scale, flexible timing intervals, and of course, that unique movement. So let's talk about a watch that we haven't discussed yet. The Giger Lecoultre 
Master Compressor Extreme Lab 2. A few different versions of this watch, but it was first shown in 2010, not launched until 2014. Why? Because it's complicated. This is a 70 joule movement with almost 600 parts, so there's a lot going on inside that case, even as large as it is. One of the finest chronograph systems ever devised. There are a lot of other features on this watch, but let's just talk about this watch as a chronograph. Digital jumping minutes. Up at 12 o'clock on that watch, we have a digital jumping minutes display, and it registers up to 60, not the usual 30 to 45 chronograph minutes. So it's easy to read at a glance. If you look to 9 o'clock on the dial, you'll also note a very special feature of the hours register it reads up to 24 hours. You never see that. This is an awesome watch as a chronograph, and I'm awarding it a spot on this list as a chronograph, but realistically, there are a ton of different reasons to buy this watch. Other features, let's see, a GMT, a multifunction crown with a function indicator and its own column wheel function selector, a multifunction twin prong push button removable Ardeon buckle for precisely sizing the straps, 100 meter water resistance, a shock resistant case, quick release lugs so you can swap in leather or rubber straps, and of course you've got that ridiculous 70 joule movement that's descended from the right hand of God. I don't think he could have done better. This thing is a monster and gorgeous to look at with nickel anthracite coating through a display case back in a 100 meter water resistant shock resistant case. Judged solely as a chronograph though, this would be one of the best ever. There are titanium ceramic versions of this watch that are the best to buy. They're the most durable, they're the most common, and they're the most comfortable, and they trade all day long in the low 30,000 range as pre-owned watches. We often have them, and when we do, I always shoot a video because I never get sick of this watch. And if you've had that problem with your watch, fatigue, this is the antidote to the common timepiece. Now, honorable mention, some watches that didn't make the list, and I, I feel I need to address this because you're going to ask, but the Zenith El Primero Chronomaster Striking 10th, this is a watch that is not altogether intuitive to read. It's difficult to read the seconds because of the overlapping blue seconds and hours scale, or I should say 60 minutes and 60 seconds register, and it's also just a little bit too fleet to actuate precisely. Those tenths of a second factor in our response time. And with the best human response time measured at one tenth of a second, I find this watch on the cusp of being too fine to use precisely or to be useful. It's a hell of a light show. I'm not going to argue. This is fireworks on your wrist. It's just not the most useful chronograph. Also, the Zenith Dayfi El Primero 21. If one tenth of a second was too fine, how about one one hundredth of a second? Moreover, the dials, especially the open dial models, are not easy to read. I can't read that, and I'm looking at a giant monitor here in the studio. So finally, the Alango Unzona double split, technically part of the Saxonia family. That's the platinum model that was made from 2004 to 2010, and it was a breakthrough when it came out in 2004. A split second and split minute chronograph it was technically innovative, but it's overpowering at more than 43 millimeters on the wrist. It wears like a hockey puck, and it has the same problem that most standard chronographs have, being relatively difficult to read about its minute scales. Let me jump real quick into the box. Maybe you guys can offer some thoughts. Edu asking, what are your thoughts on the Zenith El Primero A386 Revival? It's a good looking vintage revival, but old El Primeros are still affordable enough at well under $10,000 that for that kind of money, I would be looking at getting a good example of the original with an original and correct tritium dial. I would say go for the original because someday those will be harder to find and they're still reasonably available at reasonable prices. Right here, JBO Surf is calling out for a baby plow prof revival. I actually like that idea. I'm all about the baby plow prof. Omega, please make this happen. Right here, we have Thomas Burnett saying the plow prof reminds me of the Millennium Falcon. Search Urverk Millennium Falcon if you want to see a watch that really will remind you of that ship. And then right here, ba 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 bum ba ba bum. We have Mark S. asking, why don't Rolex use grade 5 titanium? Cultural conservatism more than anything else. There's one titanium piece on one Rolex watch, and that's the case back of the Deep Sea. But if you look at Tudor, 
they use grade two. Why is that? Probably cost. When you see a titanium Tudor watch, it is grade two. And I think that's purely down to cost. R and O is saying the Ploprof is one of the ugliest watches ever. I know, but it's pot-bellied pig ugly. It, it's like so ugly, it's almost cute. Bum, 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 bum. We got Oscar Dad joining in from Portland, Oregon. And then we have Eric Olson asking, Tim, are you in Singapore? I'm not. Watchbox is. We are in Nian City. And if you want to visit us, we have a full array of watches ready to try before you buy. And then we also have Marcio joining from Maastricht in the Netherlands. Thank you so much, guys. Jumping back into our regularly scheduled program. We have, oh, look at this. We got some more wrist chats from you guys. Jeff R. of Texas. Everything's bigger in Texas, including the Datagraph, the Alanga Unzona Datagraph Perpetual. Alex D. of Surrey, UK, hikes the trails with his F.P. Journe Elegant 48 in titanium. And Daniel K. puts us on the road again with BMW and Breitling Crosswind Special. K. Kyle and friends will take us home with the Grand Seiko Spring Drive SBGA 375. Nice watches and dog shots. Good stuff, guys. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watches on my box. Okay, another chronograph that I think goes above and beyond. Damasco DC80, 2017 to the present, 42 millimeters in ice hardened stainless steel. This is seriously tough stuff. Standard 316 steel is about 200 Vickers. This is 800 Vickers. And it is uniquely dent resistant because the Damasco ice hardening is a process that hardens the steel to its core. It is not a surface treatment. It's also a nicely sized watch. So here's the thing. This watch is obviously a nicely sized ripoff of this, which is the watch I wear on my wrist. Sometimes they say you can't beat the real thing. And this is obviously the legend that Damasco is trying to emulate. But there's a lot to love. Unlike the EZM 1.1, the DC80 remains available new. And it's a fine watch in its own right. In addition to the ice hardening and the somewhat smaller and thinner case, keep in mind the DC80 is 13.7 millimeters to 16.3 for this bad boy. So it sits under a cuff if you want it to. It has a heavily modified Valju 7750 that gives you a few extra hours of power reserve compared to the SZ1 in my Zin. You get about 50 hours of power reserve with central chronograph minutes in a 60 minute format, which I love because it's easy and intuitive to read. It also has 100 meter water resistance, 1000 or mil gauss anti-magnetism, the loom is awesome on this watch, just like with my EZM, and the bracelet is beastly too. This bracelet, here's the thing, this bracelet is awesome. Let me just talk a little bit about the timing bezel, which is actually pivoting on unlubricated ceramic bearings. So you've got a ceramic bearing bezel, and this is the only brand I know that does this. Um, there are two versions available, in white or with the hard black coating. And if you thought the ice hardening stuff was hard, this is 2,500 Vickers. So you've got the hard black coating over the ice hardened steel. Also, how about this? They claim that you can use the chronograph underwater and if you do buy the watch on the leather strap, it is a water resistant leather strap. Very, very few brands do that OEM. So here's the thing. Let's talk about the bracelet because there is a bracelet and the bracelet is absolutely bomber. It's held together by hex screws. It is entirely ice hardened and they only want a few hundred bucks for this thing, which means it needs to be an automatic option when you buy your DC80 brand new for $2,550. Yes, there is a more conventional DC86 version of this chronograph. And yes, there is a DC82 that's the DC80 with a date, but Go with simplicity, purity, and the legibility of the original DC-80. They're starting to become available pre-owned, but it's really a no-brainer. At 2,500 bucks, get it new, get it with the warranty, buy it, and be the first. As I like to say, it's only new once, and then it's pre-owned. So you will effectively have owned it both new and pre-owned. Okay, big pieces now. We're moving up the tech tree and the pecking order. This is the top of the food chain, guys, but the Glasuta Original Pano Retrograph of 2001, 
and this, not the longer double split, was the chronograph of the 2000s. 39 millimeters in rose gold or white gold. I like the white gold version. You might prefer the warmth of the rose. It is a programmable countdown chronograph. Now you can see the dial of this watch and the dial features a tri-spoke countdown minute register. That's what you're looking at at roughly two o'clock on the dial. It counts backwards from whatever pre-programmed 30 minute to one minute countdown you request. So not only does it have a countdown timer, but you can program it out to 30 minutes and here's the clincher. It chimes at the exhaustion of the timed interval. This is a chiming programmable countdown timer. But it's not just that, it's also a conventional flyback chronograph, which means you can use it as a flyback, reset, restart with one push of the trigger. It had a bespoke caliber 60 that made the magic happen. And if you want longer levels of sax and finishing, you're getting it right here, albeit with a bit more color as the combination of the silver bridges, the violet pivot jewels, the golden wheels, and the blued screws gives you a medley of color that complements the depth of this movement. So, even the 150 piece limited edition in white gold still trades in the high $20,000 range, which means you can pick this thing up for less than the new retail price of a standard 5711, and only about $4,000 more than people are paying right now for used Rolex Daytonas. This is a watch for the ages, and if you want possibly the coolest chronograph ever made, this is right up there in the running with anything for those honors. So I should mention that if you like this idea, but you don't quite want to spend close to 30 grand, the 2017 Ulysse Nordin Marine Regatta is probably the way to go. 44 millimeter stainless steel. This is a watch that features a programmable countdown up to 10 minutes. And once it reaches, after its countdown, once it reaches zero minutes remaining, it then reverses direction and starts counting up, making it the only current production chronograph that can do that. You're getting a movement with 650 parts protected by patents, and it is fully swimmable. And since UN offers a five-year warranty on its new watches, this is one to buy used. Get it a year old for 11,000 bucks pre-owned, and you're talking four years of remaining warranty with possibly the most interesting chronograph in current production. Guys, Tmaso at thewatchbox.com is where you reach out when you want to buy any of these watches from us on thewatchbox.com. Jumping into the box, the chat box, not the watch box. I can see that you guys are sounding off. Remember, I always read all your comments after the show, even if I can't always respond to all of them. Then right here, Mark S. said, Mike Michaels, our old friend, watchmaker now with Richemont, said a leather strap with rubber lining was swimmable. Do you agree? Yes, if it is entirely encased in rubber. For example, the old Panerai rubber coated straps. Those are swimmable, but if it's just rubber on the underside, like for example, a modern Zenith leather strap, that protects the strap from your wrist, but not from water. So it has to be entirely enveloped in order for that to work. And then right here, Jeff is saying, I just sent my wrist chat from Alaska. I hope you see it. I guarantee you, I will. And then David S saying, Damasco has really impressed me with the, what they offer. They have a lot of proprietary technology that are very impressive. Uh, Paul T, however, is a purist, and like yours truly, he's saying Zin all day. John D is asking, Tim, thoughts on water resistance in chronos? Trust the rating or be wary. I would say if the watch is more than a year old, don't push the limits. Screw down crowns will extend your service intervals, but if you're looking at doing real hardcore diving, and I mean like diving down to the monitor, like hundreds of feet, you're going to want to make sure you're having that watch water tested every year. And even when the manufacturer says you can use the chrono underwater, unless the watch has been serviced in the last year, I would not push the limits. A few do boast that you can do this. Damasco says you can, for example. Also, Moser with the new Streamliner says you can use the chrono underwater. I haven't tested the theory, but again, especially if the watch is outside of warranty, you've got nothing backing you up if the experiment fails. So I don't like using chronos underwater unless you are using one of the Breitling magnetic pusher systems where there is no direct through fitting from the exterior to the interior. That said, the folks who are saying use it underwater within one year after new purchase, I think you should be fine. 
Finally, guys, let me know in the description below what car you think I should buy this year. That's always a fun game to play, and I feel like I'm like the spiral circling the end here, and I have to make a choice. Fun hypotheticals. Uh, Mark S. Tim, are you still studying? You better believe it. And then Kyle asking, Tim had the option to try on the JLC Master Ultra Thin Enamel limited edition of 100 pieces. Can you believe they haven't sold all 100 yet? I've seen JLC watches from a decade ago in their boutiques, so am I surprised? No, not based on experience. Guys, comment and subscribe. Let me know in the box below what you thought, and follow me, Tim underscore Masso, on Instagram. Thanks so much to my studio audience. I got Josh, I got Sean over there on the switcher. He's the hero who makes the pictures happen. Time out, Tim out, and thank you for logging on.